So my name is Natalia Katic and I'm a PhD student on the University of Belgrade with the mentoring of Stanislav Popovic. And we constructed a model that is able to simulate the responses from cutaneous afferents and the foot sole. And this is what I'm gonna talk to you about today. So first we need to know what mechanoreceptors and cutaneous afferents are and why they are so important, especially in the foot sole. So there are four types of mechanoreceptors that are innervating the glabrous skin of the foot sole. And together, mechanoreceptors with a sensory nerve make a sensory unit that is called cutaneous afferent. So there are four types of cutaneous afferents that uh, are classified according to how they respond to stimulus and uh, how they are their receptive fields. So they are fast adapting type 1 and 2 and slowly adapting type 1 and 2. And all of these classes have unique perceptual function and they send tactile and proprioceptive information to the central nervous system, which uses that as an input in order to modulate the, the response of motor neurons because their main role is to maintain the balance during the standing and during the gait. For example, Michael Jackson wouldn't be able to do his uh, special move uh, without his special shoes because mechanoreceptors will react in this situation saying that uh, the person's center of mace is outside the base of support, so he needs to step up in order to prevent the fall. Our main goal was to construct the most reliable model that simulates uh, responses from cutaneous afferents in the foot sole. So as an input, we have a profile, a pressure profile on the foot sole, and uh, based on specific characteristic skin mechanics, we are able to calculate the stress and we use this da that data that is filtering uh, and also we apply several functions in order to get the output of the model, which is uh, which afferents are activated on uh, which exact place and what is the value of their firing rates. So what we needed to do in order to make this model, first we divided the surface of the foot sole into several separate regions because every of these regions have unique characteristics we add the densities of different afferent types and also add different skin characteristics like skin hardness, which indicates how uh, resistant skin is to indentation. And it is actually measured for every skin region with the durometer device. We use these values to calculate the Young's modulus for every foot region. We also incorporated Poisson's ratio propagation speed, which is how fast the stimuli is uh, going through the skin, and the epidermal thickness that is uh, measured with ultrasound for every foot region, and it is quite important because it has direct impact on the afferent depth. We fitted our model with the real microneurography data on hum human data uh, that was recorded in right tibial nerve, uh, with applying different sinusoidal stimuli with varying frequency and amplitude. So we use these data for our fitting procedure of the model, which uh, you, so we used evolutionary algorithm that is developed on the basis of genetic algorithms in order to find the minimum of the fitness function, which is in this case, the minimum difference between actual, the recorded firing rate and the simulated firing rate. And this is uh, what we get as a fitting results. So we fitted several models for um, every afferent type, but this is just some of them to show you the concept. So every of these dots has actual and predicted firing rate. And as closer as uh, these dots are to the linear line, it means that our fitting is done better. We validate our model using uh, absolute firing thresholds, which are defined as a minimum amplitude uh, that was necessary to elicit a firing rate of 10 hertz. And here we can see on the left uh, the, um, uh, how big is the absolute threshold depending on the frequency uh, for the recorded data using microneurography and for the simulated data using our model. Here are um, separate uh, models, individual models of the afferents recorded in, with microneurography. And then when they're incorporated in the model, here is the result. And here is the actual uh, root mean square value of all classes. This is actually the error of our validation set. So we wanted to see how our model behaves in more natural environment. 
and we use the pressure ansel to uh, to simulate the step to simulate the walking so we recorded the pressure during the walking and use that as an input to our model to see which referents in uh, in which moment are activated during the gate phase so FA2s are the most sensitive to per perpendicular light touch and also have the biggest receptive fields that cover the entire sole of the feet. So this is why we can expect that they have high activity during the whole gait cycle. Also, the transient events are mostly detected by Pacinius cor corpuscles, FA2s, and therefore the activity is on the highest level during the initial contact of the gait. FA1s, on the other hand, have the highest density on the toes, and this is why they have this peak during the push-up phase. Uh, slowly adapting, SA1s and SA2 participate more in postural re regulation, especially SA1s that is mostly associated with uh, maintain to, it is to maintain the contact of the foot on a support. And uh, this is why we have this activation during the foot flat and mid stance phase, and again, have the highest density of the, of the afferents on the toes, and this is why we have this peak. Uh, SA2s are characteristically at least sensitive, and this is why their activation is really low during the whole gait cycle. So here I wanted to show you in form of video how it looks like, the activation, the model, how it responded when person is staying, and then when it starts to walk, how different afferents are activated during the gait. And uh, since this, our model was behaving quite expected, uh, we believe that we will be able to use it in order to improve the existing system that was uh, constructed by our team uh, in order to elicit the most natural sensations. So what was the idea? Is the idea is to take the, the pressure data from the sensoride insole to transmit that to the system controller, which has inside the cutaneous current models so uh, the afferent model uh, actually generates the neuronal response, which can be used to define the optimal encoding strategy. Optimal encoding strategy will be shared, will be transmitted to the implantable uh, simulator. So with the implantable uh, electrode, we'll be able hopefully to restore most natural sensation and to resolve the sensory feedback to the patients who lost them, like amputees or patients with some kind of neuropathy. At the end, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak here and to my mentor, to my team and all the collaborators. Thanks. Okay, great. 15 seconds of, uh, of extra time. Take a deep breath and Marcos, please go with questions. Thank you very much. It's actually a, a, an incredible project in the in sense that it's a very comprehensive. I wanted to ask a very technical detail and I let Marco Capogrosso do the function uh, interesting questions. Um, so when you, um, okay, when you have like different kinds of fiber, like a, um, a SA2 or FA2 that behave very different in terms of uh, uh, recruitment curves, how does that, when you fit in the model, how does that look like in terms of the, um, the, the, the parameters? Ah, you mean to, to compare the how parameters is going to, in, ah, well. Yeah, what changes on parameters do you notice between, uh, between fibers that, that, are, um, that have very different experimental recruitment curves? When you're projecting the fitting to them, how does it look like in terms of? Yeah, well, uh, the difference is quite uh, different uh, because I will show you. For example, this low pass filter, you see it. Uh, it actually represents how uh, when um, at some point, at some frequency, some of the referents stop responding. So this is actually the low pass filter. And uh, of course, there are differences in, in that term between the different reference types. But here, you cannot generate that much because these are just, um, these are just numbers that you are actually multiplying your data with, etc. So not in all the parameters, you cannot that generate the difference. You cannot uh, find the special reason for that. But yeah, for some, of the, some parts of the, of the model, yes. <laughs> so, I actually have also a technical question, also a general, but first a technical. So you use a genetic algorithm. Mm -hmm. Why? 
Why? Uh, well, because probably that was the way to find the um, minimum of the fitness function uh, without the local minimums. It is actually not a genetic algorithm. It is um, differential evolution. It is uh, evolutionary algorithms that is based on uh, genetic algorithms. So what is done that uh, we have the, uh, that it uses <clears throat> actually same evolutionary um, operator like mutation crossover and selection as the genetic algorithm, but uh, it is guiding the population to the optimal optimal solution. So the firstly, uh, algorithm generates, generates initial population Ah, initial population and uh, takes the difference between two initial populations to add and according to that make the third uh, population. If that third population has a better fitness function, it then replaces the old old one. And that but, is how it completes whole state of, of parameters. Your fitness function mm -hmm. is based on the firing rate. Yeah, the difference between actual and the... Uh, and how did you define it? So, because, you know, there's a whole bunch of... So how do you define the difference between two firing rates? Because that's absolutely not... Uh, so this, perhaps, so what, what did you do? Like you define, like you have, I don't know, you have different pressures, you have like a time course and... And no, then no, but, uh, but firing what, what's the fitness function? Because it's very hard to define distances between two spike rates, for example. But here we had firing rates, so the number uh, of spikes in some in, in one second, and we didn't have the exact timings of the spikes, mm -hmm. and that is why difference is just a number between the two of them. And yeah, the the story was more complicated because we wanted to find the model that has the minimum uh, a minimum difference for every uh, single combination of amplitude and frequency applied to that. Ah, uh, okay. So in total, that, that is in, uh, the sum of them is a fitness function and we find the minimum of it. So the fitness function was taking into account different types of indentation in the experiment. Yeah. For the type of fire. Okay. Stani, do I have time for a second question? If it is short, you have like 45 seconds. So, and then perhaps I missed this also in Sleeman's talk. Like you get all this firing rate and then you want to put it back into the electrodes. But how do I do that? Like, for example, did you compare the output? Like what, what would it be the stimulator output that your model predicts and how it would be different from just a linear <laughs> pressure thing? Like, is it even different? Well, how we will use uh, the response of uh, the, the result of, our, of my model, the firing rates, in order to define the encoding strategy, if this is your question, we are still not sure about, and the, uh, like Sleeman today said, we were thinking again about the special model that actually translates that and uses cumulative, uh, like makes the cumulative uh, neuronal response based on the several of them. But precisely, we're not sure yet. That is the next step. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you guys for very uh, tough questions. And now we are going forward.